Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna get started at 5.30. We're just waiting for one more panelist to, to log on and then we'll be good to go. Uh, so um, sorry for the mix up. If you logged on right at 5.15 and we're wondering where everyone is, we'll, we'll be getting started uh, very shortly. One of my favorite things is always seeing the attendee count co op as the as the webinar doors open. I know. Sorry about that. It was in my other my spam folder. <laughs> no worries. Um, all right, Aaron. Uh, oh. You want to just uh, let me know when you think we're we're at a critical mass. Yeah, I think we can get started right at 530. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, thanks for thanks for joining everyone, and apologies if you were uh, sitting in the waiting room for a while, uh, wondering when we were going to start. Um, but I think this is going to be a really great conversation. Um, we're uh, we're going to be discussing homelessness with some of the, the the top experts in California and in in Clay Aldrin's case outside of California, and. Um, We'll give an opportunity for everyone to uh, all the panelists to speak for about five minutes uh, about why we have this dire homelessness crisis in California, what some of the possible solutions are. Then I'll ask a few questions, and then um, then there will be an opportunity for all of you to ask some questions. Um, so before we before we get to the questions, um, again, just a few opening remarks from everyone, starting with. Uh, Clayton Page Aldern. Uh, he's a senior data reporter at GRIST and a research affiliate at the University of Washington's Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology. He's also with uh, Greg Colburn, the author of a, a great recent book called uh, Homelessness as a Housing Problem, which I kind of like to think of as the uh, anti-San Francisco, if you're familiar with that one. Uh, I've got it on my shelf uh, back here. Really highly recommend it if you're you're passionate about these issues or just want to learn more. And with that, I'll I'll kick it over to Clay to tell us a little bit about um, why California has this homelessness crisis and and what the data tells us about it. Uh, yeah, thanks thanks Ned. Happy to be here um, with all of you and and excited to learn from the other folks on this panel as well. I'll be. I'll be pretty brief. I mean, you know, the causes of homelessness. This is this is kind of a sticky question uh, because I think the word cause means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? If you if you ask someone experiencing homelessness, you know, what what caused you to lose your housing, right? Like, why are you here right now? And this is this is something that um, you know, for example, HUD does every year during the point in time count, right? We want to understand the reasons uh, why why folks are currently without housing. And you, you get a lot of different answers, right? Maybe it's, I'm going through a divorce and I didn't have anywhere else to stay, uh, or I lost a job or I was evicted, right? There are a lot of different reasons that, that folks ascribe to their own experience with homelessness. And, and I mean, one of the bottom lines is you should believe them, right? <laughs> one, one of my core takeaways here is, uh, you know, listen, listen to what people tell you, uh, not least when it comes to ensuring housing solutions. Um, but I want to distinguish between, you know, a precipitating event, like a divorce, for example, uh, and, and, and a root cause. 
And, and in this book that you hinted at, what, what Greg and I do is we ask, okay, there are all these alleged causes of homelessness. We use that word a lot. Um, but, but to what extent can any given cause explain the variation that we see around the country in rates of homelessness, right? If, if something like poverty is a cause of homelessness, uh, or if something like uh, you know, uh, 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 an unemployment rate is, is a cause of homelessness. Might those variables explain the reason why a city like San Francisco or a city like Seattle sees four to five times the rate of per capita homelessness as a city like Chicago, right, which is another healthy you know, bustling urban hub. Um, and the, the long and short of it is um, a lot of these classic causes, right, the, the, the kind of colloquial causes that we come across when we have these conversations uh, in the media, uh, in academia with one another, uh, they, they, they don't hold up to a lot of scrutiny. They don't often carry the water of explaining variance between cities and within a city across time. So, so um, you know, short answer to uh, uh, a question that you asked, what is the cause of homelessness in, some, in you know, a place like California? Um, I would I would I would say, well, it's multifaceted, but if you want to know why California has uh, a more extreme crisis of homelessness than a city like Chicago, I, I would look at the housing market, right? Poverty rates don't explain variance in rates of homelessness, nor do substance use rates, nor do uh, rates of severe mental illness, um, right? Basically, our study shows, and, and this is the book you cited, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, um, the, the, the two best factors in terms of explaining that region to region variance, uh, they're both related to the housing market. Um, you know, and, and you, can, you can probably guess uh, what they are and we can talk more about them, but basically higher median rents predict higher per capita rates of homelessness, uh, as do lower rental vacancy rates, right? How many units are available to rent uh, at, at any given point in time? You know, so basically tighter housing markets uh, ex explain the difference between Chicago and Seattle or Chicago and, and San Francisco. Uh, you know, and, and you might say, OK, well, median rents aren't the right indicator, uh, you know, because people who are experiencing homelessness aren't making the median income or or renting at the median level. Uh, but these results hold um, if you look up and down the income spectrum. Uh, it really is the housing market at all levels. Uh, that's the strongest predictor here. Great, thanks, Clay. Um, you know, there's a there are a few angles to this. It's multifaceted, as as you said, and um, you know, one particular angle that I think is especially critical, and particularly in a place like California, is the is the racial disparities in homelessness, um, especially uh, uh, homelessness among Black Californians is just really, really startlingly high, uh, disproportionately to any other any other racial category, and um, you know this is something that's not really discussed enough. But uh, there has been some uh, important research on it uh, coming out of uh, Los Angeles with the um, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority authorities um, ad hoc committee on Black people experiencing homelessness has done some work on this, and so I really thought it was important to uh, invite someone to speak who was involved with that work, and that and that brings us to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Alicia Adams Pelham is president and CEO at uh, St. Joseph Center in Los Angeles. Uh, also wears a, a number of other hats and has worn a number of other hats uh, related to this issue over the over the years, um, including currently uh, sitting on the uh, California Department of Housing and Community Development's uh, No Place Like Home Advisory Committee as a gubernatorial appointee also working with other organizations such as uh, Housing California, California Policy Lab. Um, but I, I really wanted uh, Dr. Adams Kellum to talk about uh, some of what uh, uh, she's learned from uh, both her work at, at St. Joseph Center and also from working with uh, LASA's Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness about both the racial disparities and, and um, their causes and, and what needs to be done. Uh, so uh, take it away, Dr. Adams Kellum. Uh, thank you so much, Ned. I appreciate you having me. 
So I'll start with St. Joseph's Center. St. Joseph's Center has been serving low-income and homeless individuals for 45 years. And we have offices on the west side in South Los Angeles and also downtown LA. We have four main pillars of service, outreach and engagement. And that means just going into those encampments and connecting with the most vulnerable people and, and trying our best to uh, match them to housing resources that are in keeping with their level of acuity and need. Our next pillar is housing and we serve people in interim housing all the way into permanent supportive housing, work with a lot of developers throughout the county and um, also uh, help people connect with uh, scattered site or, or, or vouchers that they uh, port with them to landlords. Our third pillar is mental health. And as you said, Clayton, there's a lot of reasons why people find themselves unhoused. Uh, people often come to us and say, you know, and wonder the vast majority of people we serve, are they severely mentally ill? And as you said, that's not the case, but there are a large number of people who suffer from mental illness. And we believe it's really important to have um, a mental health uh, focus and team and pillar so that we can be really integrated and focus on the whole person. So that's another important area of work and where we integrate that service in outreach and in housing. And then the fourth pillar is education vocational services because we serve um, people who are housed and unhoused. We serve people who uh, have um, generations and generations of poverty that they've had to overcome. And so we have a food pantry where about 500 to 600 people come uh, each week uh, to subsidize their income by getting food assistance. And we have a cafe, a sit down cafe for the homeless. So you know, our, our education and vocational program connects because we uh, hire some of our clients into our um, various programs. We teach people how to code through our coding program called Code Talk. Culinary training helps people get into the restaurant business. And um, we also have something called Fortify, which is more generally um, uh, technology, really just believing that people evolve and do sometimes get better and can find work. Uh, and, and we want to envision people as being empowered, have an ability to, to earn a living. So Ned, you mentioned um, that you want to talk a little bit about the ad hoc work um, that I did. And, you know, we've been really a big tent uh, um, agency along with our other service providers saying <clears throat> really that homelessness could really happen to anyone. It could happen to my mom or your dad. And, you know, we really are, have been very race neutral. But the truth of the matter, when we look at the statistics and the overrepresentation of black people among the homeless, the sad reality is it is more likely for it to be my mom or my brother or my sister. And it's that reality that drove the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to really look at the overrepresentation of Black people among the homeless. And um, just to give you uh, the statistics, Black people make up about 8% of the uh, LA County population, but 35% of those who are unhoused. That statistic holds for the state of California. And it also holds for the US in general, where Black people make up 12% of the United States of America, and yet we are 40% of those unhoused. And as Clayton said, poverty and deep poverty does not explain the overrepresentation, as Black people make up only 12, 24% of those who are in deep poverty. So we have to ask ourselves, what else is going on? And the truth of the matter from our ad hoc work is that systemic racism is what's going on. The fact that uh, Black people are uh, disenfranchised in this country and that there's historical context for the overrepresentation. As Clayton said, it's about housing in, in part. It's about access to affordable housing. And if we see and we know that Black people are discriminated in housing, and it's been a history uh, with redlining and if folks haven't read about our history of redlining, please do educate yourself around um, what the implications are of redlining in our communities. Um, and we're just celebrating the uh, 
uh, beach being returned to its rightful owners here um, in, in the county with Black people who were uh, the you know, owners of a beach in Manhattan, and it was literally stolen from them. And this is part of the history of why we see um, the wealth disparities, which also connect very much to homelessness, that Black people have not had access to housing that um, was quality in nature and in neighborhoods that was worthy of investment. And through redlining, the banks just did not give loans to Black people or certainly did not allow them access to communities where there was a deeper investment. And so we still see families in deep poverty in communities without um, access to wealth. So some of the key indicators that came out of the report was that we need to not uh, still ascribe to race neutral approaches to addressing homelessness. And we need to be looking at the statistics of how black people are faring. How, what is the percentage of black people who have access to the housing resources and how are they faring in terms of falling out of homeless, uh, out of housing uh, situations. And we are finding in LA that oftentimes black people are falling, falling out of housing at twice the rate of other groups. So what is that about? And we found that the quality of the housing that's available, the acuity uh, uh, assessment, um, the vulnerability index that is the gateway to housing is not always the best measure for Black vulnerability. And so we are looking in LA at that measure and doing some research to see if that is really holding and is it a proper tool to assess who should be uh, allowed into and um, admitted into our housing spaces. So there is a lot that I could say about the piece. I hope people um, can uh, get access to the report. We really did learn, I'll say two more things, about the importance of lived experts, of making sure that we are hiring people who have been through a trauma and homelessness so that they could inform policy and practice. And that is a big part of what we learned uh, among many other things from the ad hoc report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valisha. So now we're going to transition to talking a bit about the, the policy response in the second half of this. And, um, you know, at first, starting off first with the state level response and then uh, the local response in, in one California city in particular. For the state level response, um, I invited uh, Julie Lowe to come speak. I couldn't think of anyone anyone better to speak to the, the state level response. Um, Julie Lowe is the uh, executive director of the Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is the uh, state governing body that, that coordinates all of the different uh, housing first activities happening within the state various state agencies. And we'll get into how what housing first is later in this, this talk, certainly. Um, uh, Julie also, um, has uh, some personal lived experience with uh, long-term uh, homelessness, uh, both as a as a, um, a young person, as a as a child, and, and as a as a young adult. And I think uh, just the combination of her personal experiences and her her policy expertise on this issue uh, really make her a, a, a really amazing voice to to speak to what's going on. Um, I also just have to say on a personal note that. Uh, Julie is a, uh, a grad school classmate of mine, so it's especially great to have her here. And, and with that, I'll uh, let her talk to you a little bit about um, the, uh, the state level response over the past couple of years. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thank you, Clay and Dr. Adams Kellum for sort of setting the stage for us today. Um, when I first logged on, um, I think it was Clay that said like, don't worry about being too formal. You're in Yimby land now. So I'm going to just, if it's okay, I'm just going to be a little bit more casual than, than what a state wonk might be. So um, a couple things. I think um, uh, for many people who are not as familiar with the Cal ICH, we were established in 2017 to implement the state's housing first guidelines and regulations. Um, on the face of it, that sounds like one thing. It sounds like the state's got guidelines and regulations. But the truth of why that matters to me and to us is that Housing First is one of those principles that really lifts up the humanity in this issue, right? It's like the premise of it is you don't need to be deserving of homes. Every, every human is deserving of a home. 
And um, the, the art and the trick there is how that manifests across just the enormous machinery that goes into the homelessness response. And so I, I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, in addition to Cal ICH's work um, around Housing First, we also do um, serve a council. So the California Interagency Council, Capital C Council, um, is, represent, is represented by 14 state department directors, four agency secretaries, and two appointees by the legislature. So you can imagine that a council of this size and a council represented by the state's leadership indicates a couple things. One, it's a big enough problem <laughs> that in the entire state government and leadership is focused on this in a very intentional way. There's a couple places that this has manifested. Um, one, the Cal ICH last year passed what we call the Action Plan for Preventing and Ending Homelessness. Through the Action Plan, we sort of um, are able to communicate the state's vision and commitment to shared responsibility, accountability, efficiency. Um, the way we think of this, I think, in the day-to-day -day is, can the state government coordinate and, and and be able to identify the shared vision about what it is for a person experiencing homelessness to access services. I think one thing that sometimes gets lost in this broader conversation is when we say federal funding or state funding or local funding, providers are actually doing that work. So you imagine through the layers of sort of um, rules and regulations, what, what it takes to be able to do that work well for people who are currently experiencing homelessness. In addition, um, and, and much of that is what we are trying to tackle in, through this council. In addition to the council, California Interagency Council on Homelessness last year stood up what we call the Homeless Data Integration System. And that is um, essentially a, a database that cross matches pretty important and significant data from a, a, a system that is used commonly called HMIS. And what that allows us to do is understand service patterns and the, and the way people are accessing services across the state. I think one of the things that what I just shared with you, I hope suggests is that um, as a state, we continue to invest at many levels, one in just infrastructure. You imagine the explosion of homelessness being what it is. There, there were, 20 years ago, there wasn't unsheltered homelessness the way we see it today. And so what it takes to solve the problem requires a lot more infrastructure and shared accountability and shared visioning and shared work here at the state. Um, in addition to sort of the work that Cal ICH does, our member departments administer a significant amount of state funding. So as of the most recent um, May revision on the budget, I know many folks probably heard that there was a budget deal that was reached last night. And in the coming days, lots of paper will come out about what, what, what those investments mean in the housing and homelessness world. But just at a summary level, I'll say that last year we um, the legislature did approve $12 billion in investments. And so those investments will trickle into communities across California in a number of different ways and across a continuum of services. Um, depending on where folks have um, sort of background and the way they sort of connect with this issue, I think um, it's worthwhile to say that the, the services that are required to address homelessness run the gamut. They require um, preserving, protecting, and producing additional deeply affordable housing units. They require outreach workers that really understand and can use a trauma-informed lens to serving people in, in, in a pretty tough spot in their lives. It requires services that have to be matched to people for their specific needs. And it also requires some sort of housing. And in the, in the state, in the case of the state of California, much of it is interim housing because we still do have an issue with permanent housing stock. And so you imagine you put all those things together and those investments actually run the full span of things. So I think one of the things that um, folks, I think when we, when we say housing solves homelessness, that is true, but there's an art there because this, these are human stories and these are people that have very individual needs and deserve to have their humanity honored and respected because for the reasons that Dr. Adams Callum sort of started sharing about folks are just trying to get through, they're, they're, they're coming back from, from some of the deeply structural barriers that have gotten in the way of them being able to move on in their lives and to be able to thrive. Ned had mentioned earlier that I, I am pretty open about my lived expertise. And one of the things I know is that I'm in, deep in my forties. 
And there are still things in my day to day that are, I'm impacted by from the 20 years I spent literally unsheltered as a young person. And so I just, I just want to point out a couple things when we get into these conversations, I think it's really important to lift up that homelessness is solvable through housing, but as we're getting to that solution, we also need to understand that humans are, are who we're serving and we must serve them through a trauma-informed lens to really understand that when you're, a, when you're representing government um, or the system, folks have a lot of mistrust of our system and it's incumbent upon us to recognize that and to build around that so we can better serve people. I think that's all I have for now, um, but I'll, I'll pass it on to, uh, back to you, Ned. Great, thank you, Julie. Um, well, now we're gonna talk about uh, one city in particular and it's San Francisco. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the news stories, for those of you who live in San Francisco, I'm sure you, uh, see it every day for those who do not. I mean, obviously there's been a lot of news coverage of the the both uh, very visible and just uh, very, um, very grinding and sort of saddening homelessness crisis in San Francisco in particular. Um, so I wanted to talk about, or invite a guest to talk about what the city's response to homelessness looks like. What is the city doing right now? And for that, the, the best person uh, to have on would, was uh, Cynthia Nagendra, who is the Deputy Director of Planning and Strategy at San Francisco's Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. Uh, Cynthia also is uh, the Founding Executive Director at the UCSF uh, Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative, which is a, a research organization that uh, looks into policy-oriented uh, research questions around homelessness. Um, also, my former workplace, I was policy manager before uh, coming on as policy director at California YIMBY. And uh, Cynthia is also the uh, former director of the Center for Capacity Building at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And uh, also, uh, I consider Cynthia a friend, so it's really a joy to have her here to talk to us about uh, what San Francisco is doing to end its homelessness crisis. Thank you, Ned, and thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm, uh, I just wanted to say I am uh, really honored to be on this panel with these amazing people. I am, have had the pleasure of speaking with some of them in the past, so I'm excited to be in a conversation with, with old and new friends. So I am really uh, I have to say I'm really heartened by the conversation that we've had thus far or the, the, the presentations and the points that we've made so far, starting with the systemic and structural factors that drive homelessness. This has been a real turn in the conversation. And as I think we will talk about probably later today, it's still very much um, not the mainstream kind of approach to thinking about why homelessness happens, but homelessness has generally been um, something that, you know, as, as, if, as we've heard from our previous panelists here, that it's really did not exist before the, really the 1980s and 1990s is when it really exploded. And we had a lot of the same things before that we have now. We had structural racism, we had inadequate wages, we had um, difficulty in terms of accessing mental health care and substance use and a lot of other things that really kind of drive um, people into situations that they don't are, they don't have stability economic stability um, but what we did have in you know certainly before um, the 80s was enough affordable housing really to meet the need so we had a large percentage of people who could essentially get some help with their housing uh, if they needed it. If you were low income or extremely low income, now we are across the country 7 million units short. Um, and so what's happening is, and in California, um, millions of units are short uh, here too, which is why our homelessness crisis is growing. And one thing that is really interesting, I think, to look at when you look at different communities um, is even though the smaller and medium-sized communities that we think are now, you know, if we think of as being more, more affordable or um, easier to access housing, if you look across the country now, there is not one state or one community that has enough affordable housing. And there's a great report um, from the National Income Housing Coalition that's called Out of Reach, and it really shows that across the country, we are in a housing crisis. So here in California, 
skyrocketing housing costs, inadequate wages, and systemic inequities. And specifically, we've heard um, systemic racism causing really significant disparities in who we see in uh, impacting people who are homeless. These are the drivers that are also now being exacerbated, right? So we have a lot um, of the, the gaps between wages and housing costs are growing at an exponential rate in California. And that's why you really see an increase in our numbers. One thing that um, is happened if you have been uh, looking around the Bay Area at the point in time counts, which are the counts of homelessness um, that we heard about a little bit earlier that are um, a, a count that's done every year or two years. It's mandated by the federal government, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development in order to uh, sort of show a trend, show a trend in a community. It's not a perfect count, but it does show trend lines because the methodology generally stays the same in communities. And so San Francisco just finished our 2022 count um, and we are still doing some data analysis, but our initial findings are that we had a decrease in homelessness and San Francisco had a 15% a decrease in unsheltered homelessness. So people sleeping outside on the street, literally with no shelter or no, no temporary kind of um, uh, structure to be under people on the street, in cars, um, in tents, or just sleeping on the actual street, that number went down 15% since 2019. So in three years, we saw a 15% drop there and a 3% overall drop in the overall homeless population. People are, um, you know, really want to understand why that's happening. And we actually have a pretty clear understanding. In that time period, we made an enormous investment in permanent housing solutions. And we also thank you to the local and state um, and really uh, the, the federal funding that came through the American Recovery Act, through FEMA to respond to the COVID crisis, allowed San Francisco to also open up 2,600 or so hotel rooms to use as shelter. So temporary shelter, um, what we're calling non-congregate shelter because they're not the type of shelter that's in a, in a um, where people are, are in large rooms and have to share a big space. So people were able to come inside and then we made a commitment to permanently housing all of those folks. How are we able to do that? Leveraging an enormous amount of, really an unprecedented amount of resources in San Francisco. And we're really lucky to have a local tax ordinance that was passed in 2018, um, known as uh, Proposition C or Our City, Our Home, um, that really allowed us to have now a new, really substantial amount of resources that have allowed us to invest much more in permanent housing. Previously, San Francisco has had a lot of investment in permanent supportive housing. Um, so buying up buildings and master leasing buildings for years. And that's been a, a, a good strategy, but it certainly uh, was not meeting the entire need of the people experiencing homelessness. And also not everybody needs permanent supportive housing or what we call site-based housing. People being in one building with services on site, most people experiencing homelessness, the majority of folks need rental assistance or some sort of funding to really pay uh, and make ends meet for rent. Um, they might need some initial services like housing search or move in furniture and things like that to get stabilized. But for the most part, people are really able to um, kind of, once they're in housing, stabilize. We'll talk about housing first. I heard that med, med, uh, Ned mentioned housing first. And we know from tons of studies um, and a lot of data and a lot of experience of putting people into housing uh, and, and then really kind of thinking about the things that might help a person stabilize uh, is the most effective way. It's not the only way, but it's the most effective way to get people out of um, the homelessness, like the immediate homelessness episode, as well as um, stabilize and be able to sort of um, kind of get engaged in things that are gonna help them um, stay in that housing. And housing costs and inadequate wages are only, that, that gap is only growing. So what's really important I try to tell people is we know what works. We see it all the time in communities. Um, when you have enough permanent housing, you have services, when you're able to give people things right away, people are, you know, when you're sort of um, doing outreach and you actually have housing resources for people, people will more often than that, not really want to take those resources because people actually do want to be in housing. They're not usually offered that. We're usually offering people things that they don't want or aren't really suitable for their needs. And so that's why often you see um, folks who are living outside and would prefer maybe not even to stay in a shelter because the shelter is not really providing them something that would be um, 
desirable or even help them get out of their homelessness crisis in a, in a permanent way. And so we know that housing works. We know that services um, and rental assistance and um, sort of all of the things that really are shown to be a, a fundamental need, a basic need that we all have, um, those things work. And the reason we're seeing more people falling into homelessness is because of housing costs, as well as a scale issue. We're unable to scale housing first to meet the need. And that's kind of really where we are. Um, knowing what works, being having a difficult time scaling and really needing to um, start to focus on the affordable housing issue um, in a way that is going to be much more um, a much more systemic, really, you know, instead of a sort of building by building or city by city approach, having a real infrastructure plan in California around a goal to build many thousands and millions of affordable units is really the only way um, that we're going to start really seeing uh, the needle move in terms of actually reducing homelessness across the state. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions right now, but uh, I also want to encourage the audience to drop questions in the in the Q and A. We're going to be taking some audience questions before too long. But um, first, I had a few, starting with one that um, typically is the last question that gets asked in Q and As like this. But I think it's pretty important, so I just want to put it up at front in case people need to leave early. Which is um, from all of you, just what. What can the audience do? I mean, what what should people tuning into this webinar be doing to to try and help? Uh, maybe maybe we'll just start in the in the order that people spoke. So uh, start start with Clay. Yeah, sure. It's a great question. I mean, I, part of my answer is in in the title of this talk here, right? You can you can say yes. I mean. Um, the, the opposite of a, of a NIMBY is a YIMBY, and we need more YIMBYs, right? We need people who are excited about density and excited about like the decommodification of housing, for example, right? What does it mean? And, and that doesn't necessarily mean public housing per se, though that's an interesting conversation to have, right? Decommodification can look very different across markets. It can mean nonprofit ownership of housing. It can mean rental assistance, right? It can mean like removing a unit from the private market via a variety of creative means. We need, we need people who are excited about getting creative. Um, you know, so I, I think there's, there's um, a lot to be said for offering an alternative uh, to, to encampment sweeps, for example. What, what does a sweep do? It, 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 it moves the problem from one place to another. It does not solve the problem. It makes the problem less visible for people who are housed. And, and, and so I think uh, being able to offer as an advocate a creative vision of what an alternative to something like a sweep looks like, um, I'd be you know, interested to hear from folks here uh, what your alternatives are. Uh, but but you know, I just, I, I think it's important um, to be able as, as an attendee today, you know, to be off, able to offer these visions, uh, to be able to, you know, lend an ear, right? I think one of the most important things uh, that, that Julie offered uh, was, was, was that the, the voice of folks experiencing homelessness is essential here. Uh, and, and A, as, as someone who might be housed, you need to be uh, kind of willing and able to listen, uh, but B, um, Ensuring that that those voices are integrated into the policy making process is 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 critical to ensuring the solutions match the need in question. Right, a lot of a lot of folks, right, as Julie noted, you know, not everybody needs permanent supportive housing per se. Right, if somebody loses their their unit because they got a flat tire and they were late to work and lost their job and then got evicted because they were late on rent, they don't need PSH. Right? They like maybe need a new tire or something. And you're not going to know that unless you have a conversation with them. Uh, but those conversations don't happen uh, in, in systems that treat homelessness like a monolith. And, and so I think uh, as, ad, as advocates in the world and, and, and people who are engaged with this issue, uh, we need to be willing to uh, speak to these local systems in manners that emphasize the fact that this is uh, about people uh, and, and, and not about some uh, abstract uh, monolithic experience. Um, 
I totally agree. And I think it's important as an agency that has gone into encampments and housed everyone in the encampment, which we did on Venice Beach, is um, we have to be really clear. So the alternative to the sweep is to say we won't be a part of a sweep, but we will be a part of a housing intervention and returning um, to a sense of dignity and respect to the people who are in a community, right? Because that encampment becomes a community. I used to work with um, uh, transition age youth and many of them were gang involved and they were gang involved not by choice, but by um, having a desire to be a part of a family and a community. And I think that the people in many of the encampments that we go into have given up and they have accepted an inhumane existence. And most of them look just like my brother or my father. And so uh, I hire people that look like the people in the encampments. And we go in and we talk to them about um, something that they deserve that's far better than their living conditions. And we also negotiate on their behalf so when I say it's a housing intervention, it means I got to do some work before I go in that encampment, right? I've got to have interim housing. I've got an immediate housing. And it's, it, it probably can't be a shelter uh, because that may be limiting to what people will feel comfortable you know, moving into, especially at the time of COVID. And I've got to have a permanent housing resource if I can, or I've got to have a promise to get that housing resource. And so um, we, we've got to collaborate and we've got to work together and we've got to believe that people want to be housed. I, I think the message, Ned, to the people listening is um, please educate yourselves. Read the books um, you know, that we put in the chat. Understand that we helped create this problem through these very hateful um, practices, government policies, mandates that made it so certain citizens did not have a right to housing and a safe community and that that has caused generational poverty and lack and some of those people then when one bad thing happens they end up on the streets and so i just want people to get that to understand that we're all a part of this that means we're all responsible and that no one really wants to remain unhoused they do not Gosh, I, 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 I want to double check plus everything that has been said, but a, a couple of things that actually makes me think about is like one of the things that um, I think is a challenge in the modern era. I think COVID exasperated that is, you know, grassroots organizing can do a lot for a movement. And I think about our efforts to house all people to make to make true what I think we all believe, which is everyone should have a home. How do we make that true, right? We can pass policies, we can fund those things, but within communities, they have to hold those values. And so I would say to this wide audience, which I'm sure you all are carrying your own talents, wisdoms, experiences, contacts, people, your own elected officials that you can influence. I think one thing I would, I would ask is for folks to consider what is that right role for me? And sometimes it's being a bridge builder Sometimes it's saying, you know what, I actually know how to navigate the comment card at city council. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to figure out how to how to support those who, who need a voice in the matter to do that. For some folks, it's, you know, I work in downtown. I'm a small business owner. I'm part of the bid, the business improvement district. And these folks are saying crazy shit to me today. And I'm going to take a I'm going to take a moment and get my facts right so that that next bid meeting, I can actually slow the boat on how insanely wild some of those conversations are. Or in, in the converse, if something is going really well, being a supporter of that. And, you know, I do think it, it starts with self. And I, I think that's been touched upon here. But also, you know, it, it's going to take a lot more solutions than we have. We know what the direct solutions need to be. But, you know, something like, let's get folks inside homes. Well, what does it take to get those homes up, up and going? It's like in communities where we can identify additional private market units to move into our ecosystem so we can move humans in, we need help doing that. And some of that is, is hindered by the stigma and, and quite frankly, the racism that exists. And, and you know, I think that leads me to the final point. There is no universe in which we end homelessness until we directly tackle racism. <laughs> This, this is our product of systemic barriers that were placed on particular people within our community, in particular Black, Indigenous, people of color. And part of our um, goal to become a more just 
racially just community means that we will be able to address homelessness in an authentic way. So kind of a tall order, but I, I think, you know, lots of folks just, I, I, I'm, I'm just often so touched by how much innovation and spirit and goodwill there is in the community. I think being someone who works for the state, I have the benefit of seeing across the state where people's values are. And, and while I think we often pay attention to the bad and, and I'm not trying to be overly optimistic, I think there's still a lot good there that we can tap into. I, um, I think it's hard to um, sort of add to what's already been said because I think that all of those points are incredibly important and I, I just want to underscore them, especially um, the um, what Valicia was saying about, you know, people don't want to be homeless. And even when you ask people, um, you might interact with somebody or you might know um, someone that you've seen for a long time that is in your neighborhood um, that's been living on the street. And they may even say that that's what they're, it's a choice. And there's many reasons that people um, might say that. Like I said before, the people are often not, we're not providing people what they actually need or want. And a lot of us would not accept the things that sometimes are being offered to people experiencing homelessness. So I think that's one thing to remember is that, you know, if, if we were in that situation um, and some of us have been, and uh, or could be, you know, what what would what would we want? And I think that that is an important thing to remember in your own communities when your neighbors are saying, you know, we have to do something about this person on our block, or going to your neighborhood association meetings, or you know, what NIMBYism, um, you know, can do is really make it really difficult to even have any kind of housing in in a community that doesn't look like um, the housing that is the one you might live in or is on your block. And it's challenging because we just, in San Francisco, we um, were able to take advantage of the state home key dollars and match them with a, local, with a local operating subsidy with a, a lot of funding that has come in, like I said, an unprecedented amount of funding, very lucky. The hardest thing about buying those buildings was not actually the acquisitions, it was citing them. It was being able to open the, if, for, if it was a non-congregate shelter, um, if it was a, a building, even just a housing for seniors. Um, and sometimes, that's what takes so long and makes things so expensive. So making housing cheaper means also, you know, saying yes to what is coming into your neighborhoods and also changing the perception of people experiencing homelessness as, as, as sort of it not really being a choice. It's just that if it, it's a, they're making, uh, folks are making rational decisions about what they're, what they're doing with what they're being given. And we have to keep remembering that. And if there are sort of choices that are available that are more um, conducive or more supportive or more desirable, people really do make a different choice. And we learned that a lot in San Francisco when we did the, when we opened up these non-congregate hotels, people who had been, um, you know, had engaged with the system maybe before and had a bad experience or had lost trust with the system because they haven't had much um, support or help or have been told that they're on a list and not really ever gotten any um, permanent housing wanted to engage around non-congregate shelter because it was a, a room with a bathroom that locked, you could bring your things in, you could get, um, you know, you felt safe, you didn't have to sort of leave your partner behind or your pet behind. Those things make a huge difference, right? And so I think what what people can do is sort of advocate for the things that work in, in when you're voting, when you're talking to your neighbor, when you're understanding what's sort of um, coming into your neighborhood in terms of like a new building or a new shelter. And the, as I said before, one thing that um, people are often asked, I think, are asked to vote on is, should we add more shelter or should we, um, you know, should we have more shelter? Because it seems like everyone should have some shelter and that would get people off the streets. I think it's really important to remember that a shelter is a temporary intervention. And I'm not saying at all that people don't need shelter. We don't want people living on the street. But if people have no way to get out of that shelter, um, no matter how nice you make it, if we have no ability to get people out, people are going to remain homeless. And so you can keep building shelter and keep paying to build shelter, but you'll have to build it more and more and more because if people can't get out, people are going to be piling up outside of that shelter door. And so we have to think about that as a system flow. We have to get people from who are, you know, from a, a situation where they're having a housing crisis um, to a place where they're stably housed. The other main thing I would say that people should really think about is prevention resources. So things like the eviction moratorium, we don't know all of the causation and all the data yet, but likely prevented 
homelessness that might have happened. We also know a lot of people lost their jobs, had a lot of um, issues in terms of being able to make the rent. So we, we imagine quite a few people have fallen into homelessness. And so that inflow into homelessness can only be prevented by keeping people stable in their housing before they lose it. So providing things like you know, eviction moratoriums or rental assistance on the front end, all of those things are things that work and that you can support in your local ordinances and your legislation and whatever other kind of policy things you're being asked to do in California, as we are often asked to vote on things we, don't, we aren't, expert, aren't experts in. These are the kinds of things that work. And then I think that it's important to know that um, our solutions that actually scaled can actually help. Thanks, and uh, keep those questions coming. I can see they're starting to filter in. Um, I'm going to ask one more question for the whole group, and then uh, maybe we'll move over to audience questions, although I might still throw, throw a few more of my own in there for some of you individually. But, uh, you know, as, as several of you have already alluded to, there is a lot of misinformation out there about homelessness. Um, People say a lot of crazy shit about homelessness. I think I think that's uh, those were Julie's words, um, and uh, you know we've already kind of talked about some of the major misconceptions. But I I was hoping maybe going in reverse order this time, starting with Cynthia, um, if you could each just kind of talk about uh, one or two other really big misconceptions about homelessness that you you hear a lot and why it's wrong. Uh, you're on. You're on mute. So I think I one of the ones I I often go to is the 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 question I always get is like why do people choose to be experiencing homelessness? I think I've responded to that one that we're really not giving folks um, what they need to to really exit homelessness. Another big misconception is that people are um, that the largest driver to homelessness is substance use or and or mental health issues. And one thing I often try to cite is people in our community have substance use and mental health issues at rates of, in the general population, this is federal data and state data, 30, 40% of our population have, you know, your neighbors, your family, your community have uh, experienced issues with mental health or substance use. And less than 1% of those people become homeless. And so what does that mean? It means that most people are able to um, stay housed even though they have those issues. So the idea that it's a driver into homelessness doesn't really make sense. Um, when you are housed, you, you know, it's really about the fact that we're able to see people and they're not able to access the resources they need to be stabilized. But I'm not saying that people aren't, you know, that it isn't a, a precursor sometimes or a precipitant to homelessness and that it isn't exacerbated being on the street and trying to survive on the street. Um, it's very traumatic being on the street. You may use substances to sort of um, be able to get through that experience. But the idea that it's a driver and that if we provided, you know, just if we provided tons and tons of drug and alcohol treatment, that was going to resolve the issue. It's not an either or, it's really a both and. We do need more access to services, but really the, the main thing to remember is that that's not going to resolve the issue in any kind of scaled way. Yeah, it's a very hard question. I think about it often. I think my own, my own experiences, you know, as someone who's actually sat on a curb um, being spat at, watching people walk by me, ignore, like, these are, like, deeply human issues that we're talking about here, and I think the notion of um, othering other individuals, that uh, the othering of people, particularly people of color, particularly people with physical disabilities who may not look like we think they should look, I think it makes it much easier for people to fill in those blanks, and so truly, I think, you know, I said before around, you know, our pursuit of racial equity, our pursuit of equity in all forms, I think, is going to be really important. It, they, there's no way to disentangle ending homelessness with those efforts, right? I, I think in the most immediate term, <laughs> when we hear just wild and crazy shit, I, I think the instinct is to shut people down because we're mad. It, it's very upsetting to hear that stuff. And I try, I of all people have a very hard time with it, but I try to hear where people are coming from because I think we I am often skeptical of the call-in rationale, let's call folks in, but I do think we need to do that. These are communities that need to be called in so that we have 
community solutions. That is what grassroots organizing is premised on, right? That we can find commonality and be able to move a conversation forward to the benefit of the entire community, even though even NIMBYs are not benefiting from the situation. And so I think it's just sort of trying to figure out a place in a space that we can find dialogue um, and also really pr our pursuit of racial justice is gonna be a big part of this. And so I think, you know, those conversations don't shift until we really shift those up, the other, the broader conversation about a more just world. It's, I know it's very abstract, but <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> All right, Valicia, I think you're next. Okay, I think one of the myths out there is that permanent housing developments drive down the value of a community or housing uh, that's in the neighborhood. And we actually see just the opposite. Housing developments often uh, uplift housing values. They're usually really well done, beautifully made. Um, somebody in the chat mentioned that they're expensive. We do need to find more affordable ways and, and, and faster ways to develop housing because we're in such a crisis. But there's also um, many requirements that go into those developments, who builds them, materials, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that there's a lot more information that needs to be out there about what the cost is and, and the fact that it's oftentimes 50 years of, of um, affordable housing uh, made available. And then when you compare the cost of people remaining unhoused um, and the cost of the fire and police department uh, resources and just what it's like for people to be dying on the vine there in terms of their health, the cost of keeping people in house is much more expensive than the develop developments. But I will say that the developments that we are engaged in do uplift the community and um, it helps people in that space uh, really live alongside folks who have been previously homeless. And I think there can be opportunity for greater humanity and connection. Um, I, I mostly just want to offer a word of agreement to everything that's been said thus far. Um, I, I mean, in some sense, this, this book I mentioned, um, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, is a, a book of myth-busting. Uh, we ask, okay, well, does income explain this region-to-region -region variance? Uh, does the unemployment rate, et cetera, et cetera? And, um, you know, why do, I, why do I bring this point up again in terms of myths? I want to be clear that, of course, it's true that if you have an extremely low income, you're at greater risk of experiencing homelessness. Right? It'd be ludicrous to argue otherwise. Um, the 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 point, though, is that that income matters differently in different markets. Right? The 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 effect of having an extremely low income. Right? Or or any other of the vulnerabilities we've discussed thus far. Right? The effect of these vulnerabilities is exacerbated vis-a-vis -vis homelessness in tighter housing markets, you know? And, and, and so I just, I think when we're, when we're talking about explaining regional variation, why is the problem so much worse here than it is over here, right? And, and this is straight out of like the Trump administration's Council of Economic Advisors, right? They issued this report that said, oh, well, maybe cities like California and Seattle, or excuse me, San Francisco and Seattle, maybe there are just more of quote unquote, those people there. That's why there are these, kind of exacerbated uh, uh, per capita rates of homelessness. Uh, maybe these are maybe these are places in the world that have uh, a, you know a greater a greater presence, a greater population you know of of the other right that 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 Julie spoke to. and and it's just it's just not true. it's it's often in fact, it's often the opposite, right? Um, so so I just you know to be clear, right I, I, of course it's true that you're you're more likely to experience homelessness if you have an extremely low income, for example. Um, but it's, it's, it's also true that it's easier to, an, to, to afford an apartment on a very low income in Detroit you know, than it is in San Francisco. Uh, and, and so I, I, I just want to be clear about kind of parsing these individual risk factors versus the structural causes. Like what, are those, what do those structural causes do? What does the housing market do? Right? Location exacerbates vulnerability. Great. Well, let's um, 
Let's move on to audience questions now. Um, and please, again, if you have a question, drop it in the uh, the little Q&A icon at the bottom. Um, the first one is from Matt Webster, who asks, would love to hear reactions to the recent New York Times piece on how Houston took an apparently successful housing first approach to homelessness. Would that, would Houston's approach work in San Francisco and Los Angeles? And what are the obstacles to doing something similar here? Um, so maybe maybe I'll kick that one again to, to Cynthia first, since uh, you know you're, you are an expert in the obstacles in San Francisco. Um, but then uh, would love to hear from from anyone else who's who's read the article. And you're you're on mute again. Apologize. It's only been two and a half years. Um, I appreciate the question because I have been thinking about this um, as well, especially now that I am actually, you know, uh, at the homeless department in San Francisco, I used to work at a national organization where we would look at cities across the country to see what was working and what wasn't working. And in those communities that, that we were seeing major decreases or interventions um, really having successful outcomes, what was the, what was the difference, right? And, and can it be influenced in other places? And Houston has been, um, has been on our radar as a field for five, six years because they, they had been steadily decreasing, they have been steadily decreasing homelessness. And so even five years ago, um, their plan uh, to go all in on housing first is really where they started to um, turn the corner. I think it's about seven years ago now um, and they've refreshed their plan. But essentially they decided to go all in on a permanent housing strategy and really just be laser focused on housing people um, in, in whatever ways they could and make that as streamlined and efficient as possible. And yes, the housing market um, in Houston is different than the one in San Francisco. There's no question about that. It's the fourth largest city in America. There are some, you know, there's still not enough affordable housing there, um, but there's definitely, uh, the housing market is different. But I, and, I, and that does account for some of this, but I wanna say that one of the things about Houston is that they had, they mostly get federal funding and some local funding because Texas doesn't put a lot of funding into homelessness. What does that mean? It means that they're sort of mandated to follow a strategy that they all kind of, the people in the community have to kind of align around. So you're not having a lot of different, I mean, you might have different opinion, but you sort of have to align um, on, on some of the, the mandate from the federal government to follow housing first strategies. And you also have um, kind of a, the, the way they're set up, um, and they have a lot of support from their mayor and some of the local community. They're just very aligned on the strategy. The thing about implementing that in San Francisco is we are in essence trying to bring much more housing first orientation and approaches to San Francisco. It is definitely harder in terms of the scale and the number of units we need and the amount of money that people need to stay in their units. That is a difference. I don't think that means that um, the, the, the strategy doesn't work. I think that the difference really is um, the ability to navigate the market that we have. And we are getting better and better at doing that across the country. We're getting better at um, service providers really understanding how to work with landlords, how to incentivize landlords, how to make sure that we're renting to, um, to folks who are able to, sometimes they can maintain the rent on their own, or they just need a little bit of money. A shallow subsidy is something we've been trying um, more and more. Maybe 500 bucks a month is all you need to keep, or $300 a month. So as sort of patching people between rent and um, and what they're making or what they're, they're, they might be on a um, fixed income is another way to work with the market we have. It is gonna be more and more saturated, um, but we can navigate that market if we um, you know sort of really align like Houston has. And certainly we have to keep the supply um, in, in, in proportion to the demand, no question. And maybe I'll uh, kick the question to uh... Alicia next to talk about um, Los Angeles. Would would Houston strategy work in LA? We recently went through a blue ribbon commission and then the folks from Houston actually came out. And I think there are some interesting ideas that have been put forth. And I don't think I can say any more than what Cynthia said. I mean, I do think the cost of living, um, you do have to look at those things and what it costs, um, you know, for housing. I think that 
that is something that we look at when we, we're talking about rapid rehousing and what it costs to just get someone into an apartment. I mean, in LA, we're talking two to three thousand dollars. I don't know exactly the rental market in Houston, but I believe it's more expensive, right, Cynthia, in LA and San Francisco and our housing. So, so you, you kind of have to take that into consideration, as you said. But I do also agree with, with what Cynthia said, is that a, a unified, um, agreed upon strategic focus, uh, leadership that will clarify the direction that we're going in and really align the resources. And I think that's how we, we did it in a small scale in Venice when we say we housed 200 people over a six week period. It was really just that the elected officials um, said, Valicia, we're going to give you the reins. We're going to give you the resources. We're going to allow you to work with the city departments and we're going to work together night and day uh, until everyone is housed in, in a way that is humane and dignified because that was the agreement no arrests, we wanted to do it right. So I'm just thinking that we do need um, a real focused effort. There's about, you know, if there's three or four or five things, master leasing, you know, some of the prevention work, making sure we're building housing that is um, affordable and um, nimble and, 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 and we can be swift. Uh, and, and I think that is what's missing for all of us. And when we can in LA and San Francisco get a, a little more aligned, and I think we're getting there and I think we're trying to test out what that can look like, I think we'll have better results. And I think some of the things that Houston is doing can be um, very helpful to us in our, our plans. One thing, if, if you don't mind me jumping in that, one of the things that occurs to me around this conversation is um, many communities are, in progress towards that, right? I don't. I don't want us to forget that it's it's not all or nothing. And when we when you actually look at the Houston article, they started over a decade ago, right? And so the, these are these are systems in the making. These are relationships that have been forged, right? You think about like what it takes to change a system. I know that's what we need. We need to improve the systems and the way we're we're serving folks. But across California, one of one of the wonderful things I get to see through my vantage point is sort of start to see like so many people are talking about landlord engagement in one way. So many people are understanding the necessity to have um, trauma-informed care, um, to be able to support people during that wait. So many people are talking about system flow. That's not something ha that happened years ago. And so a couple things I would flag is that I do think that the that that the premise of housing first that it's what it's built on, right? And it, it isn't just about housing; it's about it's it, it it premises housing needs to be the foundation. It's not housing only; it's got services attached to it. And more specifically, that model means that when you get someone indoors, they can develop psychological safety to be able to start to think about what it is that they want to see for themselves. They can then move on to a place where they start to build community bonds that that maybe build upon the ones that they had when they were outdoors or start to reconnect with the ones that were important to them. Then they start to move towards, how do I start to um, uh, navigate and, and become more autonomous in terms of my own finances, right? They're, they're, these are very distinct things that need to happen. And, and I, I think it just takes time to do these things. I know there's an urgency and, and we always call it walking and chewing gum. Like we gotta get fast, but we also need to continue to build these systems so that they're sustainable. I'm sorry if you don't mind when I jump in. Moment. I know I've already had my um, my say, but I I just wanted to say this this conversation about you know uh, housing first and you know how you really navigate what's what's happening in uh, in our markets. The 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 thing also about Houston I think is really important to remember is that it's not just the homeless system that's trying to do the job. So what Julie was saying is what made me remember this is that. They started 10 years ago and they started bringing people on. They started talking to each other. Housing authority, we really need your vouchers. Instead of sort of, you know, we could target vouchers in a much more strategic way so that we're really targeting them to people who are very vulnerable and could not exit homelessness on their own. Um, the public, you know, healthcare, 
we really could use some more dollars for people who are exiting institutions or exiting the hospital. Um, you know, foundations, we really need your philanthropic dollars to do these investments that we can actually do through city and state and uh, federal dollars. So we're, as Julie said, we're building that, I think, all over California, but we're distracted really easily by things that seem like quick fixes and that can happen anywhere. Um, you know, like I said, sometimes it seems like this is gonna be the silver bullet. There it really isn't, it's a, it has to be a coordinated strategy across health, housing, you know, your public work system, your, there's a lot of parts of this that need to come together. Um, and it, the home system is an emergency room. You need um, much more than the emergency room to take care of a whole person, right? And so that's really what needs to come together more and more. And we have in California, the Medicaid waiver um, is, is going to provide us Un, you know, supports that we will be able to use in all these interesting ways, and we have to coordinate with our managed care plans locally. It's a whole new world. It's 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 exciting, but it's going to require an enormous amount of coordination and capacity. But it, that opportunity is there, and it really can be a game changer. Thank you, <laughs> Clay. Did you have anything to add? I just want to underline uh, something that Cynthia said that I, I think is fundamental here and, and and maybe just in concrete terms, right? If you live in in you know Salt Lake City or Houston, we're using the Houston example, and you you're 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 in a rapid rehousing program, right? You came through some kind of coordinated entry system, you know, you were determined to be eligible for some, you know, means tested rent support for eight months, right? You've got a lease in your name, and all you need to do over those eight months is like figure out how to increase your income a little bit. And, and, and you know, you're talking to people, you're getting back on your feet, eight months rolls around. If your income was $500 and you need to get it up to let's call it 1200, doubling your income, that's a serious task, but maybe it's possible over eight months if you've got some support. If you're doing the same thing in San Francisco and you're making the same amount to begin with, you don't need to double your income, you need to quintuple it. And like anybody on this call, can you quintuple quintuple your income in, in like eight months it's just it's bananas and and so when you know somebody used the word scale earlier maybe it was also Cynthia I, I think um when I think about housing first as a model the word scale feels really important we know that we know that housing first works it works when we can scale it and and it's really <laughs> it's a really straightforward process to scale it in accommodating markets and in non accommodating markets, you know the theory is good, but in practice you kind of wind up throwing people to the dogs. All right, we have a, a an LA centric question. So this time I'm going to put Alicia on the on the hot seat first. Um, <laughs> this is from uh, Timothy Sola. He asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the LA Times piece documenting $1 million per unit for uh, the cost of affordable housing? Uh, I, I assume building affordable housing. Uh, what steps would you suggest to reduce this cost? I'm not a developer, so I don't think I'm the best person to respond. But I think it is important to note that in the affordable housing space, there is a lot that developers have to do in order to bring that development to, to, to fruition. And some of it is time of getting the multitude of funding streams. It's the tax credits. And it actually is the fact that um, we have to pay people uh, a certain living wage. It, it is expensive to build. Now, the 1 million, I often, when I looked at that, when I saw that piece, I wondered, if that was more an outlier, I think someone put in the chat something like 500 or 600,000 per door. I think they left out the K. I think that number we've seen much more than the million dollars. I think that those kinds of um, pieces though are frightening and sometimes undermining to what we're focusing on in Housing First because people don't realize how expensive it is to keep people unhoused. To, to imagine how much it costs for the most vulnerable to remain unhoused. We did a study in Venice some years ago and we looked at the most vulnerable people in the streets of Venice. It was like a hundred people. And over um, a, a few months, they were costing $500,000 just in um, hospital visits and, and, and so forth and, and being picked up by uh, LA, and fire, LA Fire Department and LAPD. And that's why I think in LA we have housing for health 
really saying that housing is health and, and taking the money from the frequent utilizers and the costs of that 10th decile, that very vulnerable group that's, that is most costly in a community and actually reversing that and saying, let's do housing first. Let's actually put people in housing and it's much more affordable to, to take that very vulnerable group and house them and wrap mental health services and health services around and they get better. They truly get better. I mean, for us, having served the most vulnerable off the streets of LA, we have a 95% retention rate, which means once we get people housed, they remain housed. And that tells you they get better, they get stronger. Some of them do choose sobriety. Some of them um, do choose a, a much healthier lifestyle because they're finally able to breathe and um, get better in a lot of ways. So I can't answer all of that question, but I can just address it in the way that I can as a service provider. Thanks. I, I want to kick it to, to anyone else who, who has anything to add just about the, the cost of building affordable housing in California more, more generally. And, and maybe I'll add to that the cost of um, building permanent supportive housing and, and other forms of uh, supportive housing at scale. I did want to uh, make one clarification first, because we got a question about this in the chat. Um, someone asked, what's the Medicaid waiver? Um, so, uh, uh, California sought a waiver to, um, offer some wraparound services and be able to bill Medicaid for them. So, uh, things like, um, I believe housing, housing placement, um, uh, case management, uh, these the things, uh, now, yeah, sorry. Security deposits. Um, Security like deposit, yeah. So, so California can now bill, um, uh, CMS, the the federal uh, Medicaid agency for those for those things. Um, I see I see Clay has his hand up. Yeah, just just very briefly on the on the cost question. Um, I, I'm you know a little less concerned with the number per se. Is it a million? Is it nine hundred thousand? Is it six hundred thousand? It's you know what's true. It's like too expensive to build. That that is true. It's too expensive to build affordable housing. Um, but 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 why is it expensive to build affordable housing? That question differs from place to place. And just to bring this back to the the Houston uh, conversation real quick, right? There's this great study from a couple of years ago. You know, that basically shows how responsive a given city's housing supply is to changes in population, right? Because one of the things that affects uh, the the price of housing is the demand for it, i.e., how many people do you have? Uh, so you usually want to be able to build in response to growing population. So what affects the extent to which you are responsive as a market to changes in population? It's basically two broad factors. There's topography, right? Do you have mountains and, and water? You know, because if you do, you can't build on it. Um, in Houston, you can sprawl. That's not necessarily true in, in LA. It's not necessarily true uh, in, in San Francisco. So, so you, can't, you can't build on water. Um, the other factor is policy. Right, like how easy is it to build in a regulatory sense, and that's that's really the only thing you can change uh, in terms of in terms of a policy environment. Um, you know, so if, if you accept the premise that homelessness has a relationship with housing at all, which you know I think we should all argue that it does, um, you know, then housing supply should matter, and 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 cities' choices around how easy it is to build should really matter. I can just jump in here. One of the things that I, that occurs to me about this conversation is be it a million dollars, be it $600,000. I, as a private citizen, how much would it cost me to buy a little bungalow anywhere in the Bay Area, right? Just that, like if we think about what that costs, right, we should compare our own private experiences to what we're trying. It, 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 all of a sudden you're like, ah, actually, I can see how the cost could get there, right? If, if we want to pay people fairly, not put people in harm's way. I'm not saying there might not be some folks doing some hoo-ha. I, I don't I don't know enough about it, so I'm not accusing anyone. But you know, th there might be some marking up of the issue. But really, if we think about what we individually would be paying for housing costs, that is that's the going rate. Um, so you know, one of the things I think about is when we say um, when we say we we want to be able to um, house people, we have to again believe that they are part of our community and what we and what we have to experience is, is sort of the path forward with them as well. If I could add one more thing on the on the cost, you know, I said I said this earlier, so it's really I'm repeating myself, but the the length of time that it takes to cite 
um, and to get the permit to, to really to be able to build that actually adds a lot of expense to the cost of building that unit that is part of that million dollars per unit is how long it took how many lawyers you needed how many hearings all of that stuff really adds adds up and it becomes harder and harder to, for it to pencil out for affordable housing developers and so that's another time that's another place where we saw it when we were able to through this emergency ordinance from the state buy a lot of buildings because and cut through a lot of regulations that would have taken us years and years and years and would have made the cost of that, the staff time, the lawyer, all of that much more expensive. And so the, the, the length of time it takes to acquire and to be able to use that, uh, you know, have the zoning and all of that sort of ready to go, that also makes a big difference in reducing the cost of housing. Um, so uh, we have another question from uh, Linda Kelly. Uh, this might be um, this might be a Julie question because it's about uh, sort of the state level response. I think it, it says, "How can we do more to get smaller agencies strong enough to be able to qualify for funding without uh, without brushing them with uh, larger agency standards?" There are a lot of smaller agencies doing the work, but they they can't get they can't get funding. Yeah, I think there's quite a bit of conversation here because I think the providers that are available to any system has a direct relationship to the to the goodness of fit right if you think of what a, a large agency like I, I, and and there are some instances where a large agency with bigger infrastructure makes sense there are lots of situations where a smaller um, situation make a smaller agency can better serve the needs of that particular population um, there are a couple of things that I've heard sort of bright spots about I was just in um, Oakland last week um, with the Secretary of our Agency announcing the award that California Cal ICH made to 10 Family Challenge grant, grantees. And part of what had worked out in the city of Oakland is that they had already previously started working on capacity building for smaller organizations to be able to, um, to apply for, for grants. And um, because that capacity building had existed and there was a focus particularly on Black organizations, they were able to, the city was able to put together a proposal that made sense for the state to find. It was wonderful. It, like in those situations, it was exactly that because the three, the I met four of the providers that were part of that grant and they all are, are of the community. They all had lived expertise. They were all deeply embedded into the work that they were already doing. And so I do think that as we move um, towards how can we better serve people, that conversation will become, will continue to write to, to sort of, rise to the tops of lots of people's minds. I would say from a state perspective, there are efforts underway to try to streamline the way, um, streamline both the, the grant process and streamline sort of the way people get information in terms of provider networks. I, I know that that's a, that is a, that's a work in progress, but I, I do think that there's quite a bit of activity going on that you know in the coming years should start to shift that shift sort of the traditional way, which is if, if you are big enough to write a great grant, um, uh, a great grant uh, proposal that you're gonna get funded. And, and I think there's lots of people doing things like trying to understand to what extent does, does this particular entity um, meet other criteria aside from their size and their administrative might, right? And so I, I think that again, equity issues, go goodness of fit issues sort of opening up the lens of what we consider to be competence. So can you serve this particular population? Who is that population? Based on what justification I think starts to bring in the small, in particular, the smaller providers. And Ned, if I could just add, the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness also zeroed in on the importance of the local provider, the Black and um, Brown led organizations. And uh, certainly we have had some of our foundations, Hilton Foundation, Weingart Foundation, California uh, Wellness and, and others, um, California House, uh, Community Foundation has been really helpful in providing grants to um, 
black led organizations, members of the ad hoc committee who are attending meetings and helping shape policy. And it's hard when you're a small organization to be at all of these meetings and spend so much time working on policy. So we're actually funding um, them and allowing for their time to be paid for. And we're also funding the lived experts who are around the, the, the table to really give of their time. And the other thing that I think is important is for larger organizations in black and brown spaces to allow the smaller agencies to co-locate to um, collaborate on um, various contracts and proposals so that there is a pass through. We did some work with an agency called Timeless. It was uh, a group of folks uh, who were recently uh, incarcerated, many, many years of incarceration and wanting to come out, but smaller and couldn't afford the high costs of insurance and meeting the demands of, of some of the LA County high levels of, of insurance um, requirements. And so we did some work with them and made some recommendations and referrals. And now they are sole sourced or direct source to um, the county for some of the housing. But just four or five years ago, when they first came out to LA, they were not able to directly access those uh, contracts. So again, standing up and speaking on behalf of the smaller organizations, allowing them to co-locate and uh, creating hybrid positions where we actually hire many of the timeless folks to do our case management or our hybrid work, which is sort of like ambassador work, kind of a hybrid of case manager and security guard. And I think those are the ways that we can start to bring those really critical resources of the local uh, uh, community organizations into the, our space. Cynthia, I, I saw you had your hand up. I, I just wanted to sort of build on that a little bit too. I mean, um, the, the working with smaller um, or medium-sized organizations also is a way to actively respond to advancing equity. Um, you know, we talk about sort of not wanting to perpetuate harm and not wanting to perpetuate disparities. And I think that we are I'm, I'm, we're trying to, at least uh, in our community, and I think many, many communities, I know certainly we learned a lot of this from LA, um, is to how do we advance equity? How do we reduce disparities? Well, it means that you have to do much more thoughtful targeting and infrastructure support for small and medium-sized organizations that may be serving people who are historically marginalized. So for example, in San Francisco, we, we got from the Federal uh, American Recovery Act uh, vouchers. We don't usually get vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, essentially housing choice vouchers that are uh, given to the homeless system essentially to prioritize. And we wanted to, one of our goals was to prioritize, to advance um, equity in terms of prioritizing people who have been historically marginalized and neighborhoods that have been historically marginalized. And so we in San Francisco have a, a district that has uh, been severely impacted by redlining, a history of redlining and policies that have really um, had made sure that people are not able to access the housing market or build housing assets that way. So by um, sort of focusing vouchers into that neighborhood, and to the providers who live in that, live and serve in that neighborhood who are smaller and medium-sized organizations, often black and brown led and serving, we, um, you know, the, we're able to sort of really target those vouchers to people who are unsheltered, historically marginalized, and build infrastructure in those nonprofits, not just by just giving them a grant, but helping them, as Julie was saying, build capacity. That means you're really helping support finance, like building financial systems, administrative systems, um, you know, really making sure that an organization can scale when you're giving them a big contract. And so all in all of those ways, um, those are ways to kind of actively advance equity, not just sort of you know, try to not be inequitable, but actually try to reduce uh, reduce disparities. And those are often the organizations that the people do trust. We were talking about trust, and often they're led by folks with lived experience. And so we need those organizations to be in the fold and to be empowered and to have the funding that they need to really run uh, properly and be sustainable. Uh, Clay, did you have anything to add? No, I'm I'm good. Thanks. Okay. I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I mean, it, it it goes back to something we were speaking about earlier, right? Which is which is this issue of trust, right? As as Dr. Adams come just raised. And 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 also I think the notion of of both listening to people, right? Hearing people tell you what they need 
and finding the right folks, i.e. the right service providers who can have that conversation in a manner that engenders trust, right? Because that conversation looks different when there are different service providers involved. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a good note to close on. Um, we're almost we're almost at seven, and um, you know, I just I just like to wrap up by uh, thanking everyone who participated, uh, Cynthia, Julie, Valicia, Clay. I mean, I I personally feel like I learned from a lot a lot from this conversation. Thank you also to the audience for caring about this issue and joining us and and asking questions. Um, you, you know, since we have just two minutes left, I'll, I'll add. Um, so uh, there's Clay's book, uh, Homelessness is a Housing Problem. Uh, Valicia mentioned, um, I believe, The Color of Law. Um, any other, any, I mean, BMBs are nerds, nerds love assigned reading. Any, any other reading people would uh, recommend? Okay, Cynthia mentioned Evicted. Um, yeah, well, with that, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating and for asking questions. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for, for more. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Ned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ned. Bye-bye.